Right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Inga Thoda, and I am delighted to be here to chair this very important and timely panel discussion on the global economic outlook. Well, after a fairly, dare I say, positive start to the year, uh, concerns over the global recovery have continued to mount, not least after China's economic activity plummeted with retail sales falling rapidly and contraction in the industrial production. The Eurozone forecasts have also been cut as the war in Ukraine disrupts supply chains and drives up energy commodity costs and with it inflation around the world. This morning, we also woke up to sharp falls in markets across the globe, which started in the USA and then cascaded around the world A gloomy forecast from retailers there. So you can forgive anyone for being concerned if they read the business pages these days. I saw the word warning appear in more headlines this morning than I've seen in a very long time. We will touch on all these topics with our panelists, as well as seeing what all this will mean for the urgent need for governments and businesses to tackle the climate crisis, which will, as we know, require substantial financial resources. So our expert panel here today has a lot to cover. And although this all sounded quite pessimistic, I'm also hoping that they will give us some cause for optimism. So without further ado, let me introduce the stellar cast that we have. Chris Gopalakrishnan is the chairman of Axilar Ventures in India. Vinod Shekhar is the chairman and group CEO of Petra Group in Malaysia. And Deborah Wynne-Smith is the president and CEO of the Council on Competitiveness in the US. And she is also the president of the Global Federation of Competitive Councils. Um, we will also we could possibly hopefully be joined by Eric Bergloff, uh, the chief economist of the Asia Infrastructure Bank, and from Andrei Kolodyok from Ukraine. Um, so if they join us, uh, that would be great. But I am going to kick off a little bit with the news that, uh, that has been uh, happening in the last sort of 24, 48 hours or so with the, the stock market and the downward spiral there. feels like China could be a good place to start on that. Um, Chris, maybe I could sort of come to you first. The sort of contraction in China is obviously a, a sort of a big worry do you see this as a um, you know, cause for concern or is this a little bit of a blip in China? Uh, Inka, uh, thank you. And thank you for having me on this panel. It is a cause for concern because China is the second largest economy in the world. Uh, it drives many economies, especially in Asia. It affects the supply chains everywhere. For example, um, you know, if you want to take delivery of a car today, they will actually send it to you without the entertainment system because they can't get the entertainment system uh, fixed without the chips from China. So uh, it does have a um, significant impact on, uh, um, you know, the economies of uh, other countries and supply chains of many, uh, many um, uh, industries, actually. Uh, what is worrying is that after two years, if um, we have not figured out how to fight COVID virus, um, that is a cause for concern. Uh, does it uh, mean that uh, this situation will get replicated in other economies? Because, you know, COVID started in China and uh, you know, it's come full cycle. So. Uh, it is a cause for worry for me, especially both from the economy perspective as well as um, from uh, you know, what it uh, portends for all of us in the future. Yeah, Deborah, you, you mentioned a little bit about sort of Xi's policies and what they have meant for China's downturn. I mean, COVID is still a huge problem in China, which we're perhaps not expecting at this point. And then, of course, uh, Xi's uh, support for Putin. Um, has uh, been uh, uh, sort of problematic for him as well. Do you think that this is still going to be, um, you know, lead to even further downturn in China? Well, I think, as, as we all know, what's happened um, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the response both in Ukraine and Europe around the world is really a tectonic shift. And the fact that there's a realization we, we've really moved into a, a bipolar world with the more democracies, liberal economies and political systems, and then sort of Russia and, and she aligned with Putin. I think in retrospect, he may have wished he hadn't 
been so favorable during the, the, the Olympics, but he's sort of trapped in that. And then you couple, it's, it's really a perfect storm. You couple that now to, as you de- described, and, and Chris has mentioned, you know, their policies on COVID, um, you know, the recent lockdown in Shanghai and just the world seeing people, you know, trapped inside, old people being taken, you know, to center. It's, it's sort of brought to the world the whole vision of a very autocratic system that is both shot and probably will not have the impact that's intended. And then of course you add to that what it's done to the already um, uh, acceleration of the extreme disruption, fragility and global supply chains from, you know, advanced components to, you know, core materials. It's, 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 and then of course now the very um, shocking uh, lower growth projections and, you know, president, she had, been very proud for some time about uh, what you want to say, stomping down on the, the the two independent tech sector and their big tech champions. And so I think his the policies are very much in question on a political front, but on the economic front, as as Chris has said, and and I know um, our colleague from Malaysia will say it's it's very very serious what it's going to ripple through the global economy. Um, I would say that in in the case of the United States, and I'm even seeing that in Europe and, you know, India and Malaysia are different parts of the world. And they're still, I mean, India, Chris, I know for a variety of reasons, India is still a little bit more non-aligned than the Europe um, and other parts of the world on what's happening with with Ukraine. Um, But there is a decoupling underway, both philosophically and economically now. in the U S and the major economies of of Europe, even for Germany now that has been so interconnected to be talking about decoupling with China. Those are really major, major tectonic shifts. And this is a time in human history where, you know, we're going to see things happen that are in crisis, but take us out of crisis into a new space. And I know we're going to talk about those things, but it's a perfect storm right now. And China is at the epicenter. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting you talk about decoupling and, and Vinod, if I could come to you, it is harder for the countries in Asia to decouple from China, where it is such a, a dominant sort of force. I mean, how do you see this play out in your region? In Malaysia. Uh, mm-hmm. Look, uh, let's be very clear here. We cannot ignore China. China is not going anywhere, whether we like it or not. China is the... The, the, the elephant in the room, the, the, the lion in the, in the cage, it's, it's just there. Um, what it, its policies on, on COVID, it's the way it's treating its uh, handling of, of, of COVID has been dangerous uh, and uh, it's a failure, to put it bluntly, but they're not shifting from it, which is disturbing, um, which is disturbing. Uh, it, the, what, what Chris has said, the impact, and what Deborah said, the impact is, is significant. Um, not just to the high tech industry, but everything. Uh, in our own businesses, the different businesses we have, just simple raw materials that we need uh, are either delayed or highly priced, overpriced to, to levels that don't make sense anymore. Uh, logistic costs are shot up. We've got material that even when we get it, they're stuck in China, they're stuck in a port because they can't leave. Um, you know, this is having an impact across the board. So that there's no escaping that impact on us. But I am a half class full person because I've seen these cycles of disasters in the world, whether it's the Asian financial crisis. Uh, if you remember in 97, when the world came to an end in Southeast Asia and Malaysia was a country didn't know why. We had 10% growth for 10 years and all of a sudden our currency collapsed by, you know, 50%. Um, so we've been through this. We went through the global financial crisis. Now, obviously, this is different. Uh, this pandemic has, has has changed the way we see the world and we see each other. Uh, it has, while it has brought a lot of insularity among certain countries, it's definitely shown the need for us to work together. You know, it has shown the the what capitalism is capable of in terms of vaccine creation, the best of what capitalism can do. But it's also shown, as as uh, someone pointed out in an earlier uh, session. It's also shown the worst of capitalism when, you know, it's it's my vaccine. I only want it for my country. You know, it's my vaccine, it's only for my country. And suddenly the poorest countries can't get access to it. 
Um, so, you know, we're dealing with so many different things right now. And then, of course, as you said, markets collapsed. I'm not so yeah. concerned that the markets collapsed because that's, you know, these are these are quarterly issues and and half yearly issues that, that we all go through and it will pick up again, as it always has. But there needs to be a reset in everything we do and how we do it. Yeah. There needs to be a reset in Southeast Asia of how we deal with China because for too long, we've, we've been, I'm Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Southeast Asia has either been too scared or too dependent on China uh, in everything we do. Uh, it's, 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 and if you go one step further, look at Sri Lanka and what's happened to Sri Lanka. I mean, um, it doesn't take a lot to work out why and how that happened. Yeah. Um, now, the you of you. this engage is, 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 is difficult. You know, this engagement has been there for decades, you know, uh, and it's, it's, it's not going to be easy. But you've said this, Deborah. Opportunities are created from, from situations like this, where, you know, everything's in disarray and uh, there's a perfect storm, as you say. But this is where people have to come together and work out how we now reset. I hope that the world and the leaders, uh, economic leaders, use this opportunity to really reset. You know, this yeah. is what we have. That is an opportunity. We don't get these kind of opportunities very often where everything's laid out for a thing. We know what's disastrous. We know what's bad. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. It's laid out for us now. Here's a chance for us to now do something. The question is, will we? Yeah, that, that is the, the very good big question. And, and, uh, um, first of all, I want to welcome Andre Kolodjuk to the panel. Thank you for joining us. Um, and we're going to come on to, to Ukraine in a minute. But I, I do want to pick up on a point that, that you know just made about the inequality and the, how the sort of uh, economic recovery from COVID was starting to look like a, a, a sort of a two-stream track, really, uh, with you know capitalism perhaps showing its, its worst side here. I mean, do we think that that what is happening now is going to polarize the world even further in economic sense? That the rich will get richer and the poorer will get poorer based on COVID, the access to vaccines, you know, the the big countries sort of being unable to stop it. Um, I mean, Deborah, what do you think about that? Well, I, I'm I'm more on the optimistic side. I think we have navigated the, over the last two years the worst on the issue of vaccine equity and distribution and access. That's that's still a, a serious issue. But I think the WHO and I know the United States and others are working very hard on that. Um, South Africa is turning out to be quite a success story in how they have both um, accessed and distributed and and dealt with, you know, protecting their population. And interestingly, in you know, some parts of the world, we've seen elderly people being the first to be taken care of. And in other parts of the world, they're still not vaccinated, which is, of course, the, one of the, the tragedies in China right now. But the, the vaccine development, um, and we're very proud about it in the United States and, and our partners that we work with. I mean, it's an ex incredible example of innovation at scale that took decades, you know, of work and the RNA technologies. And it wasn't just a, a, a revolutionary system um, that moved beyond putting, you know, the 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 the, the uh, infection in an egg, but it was the production, the scale, all that. But we, of course, have the skepticism. I mean, there are many, many people in the so-called developed world. They don't want the vaccine, and we're going to have to live with it. We're going to have to live in a world where we're going to have new strains and things, and we can't lock down and shut down our economies. I mean, there are children in the United States, and I'm sure, you know every one of our countries on this panel and, and her races that have suffered terribly on learning through this, but we've moved to hybrid learning, hybrid work. And so there are some good things that have come out of this as there always are. And, and on the optimism side, I know we're going to get into that a little bit, but th there's some very exciting things that are happening in the world, but on the crisis front, I think the other thing that we haven't mentioned yet that's so critical is this trifecta of food, energy, and water, and how they're impact, being impacted now by the invasion, by the economy, by supply chains, and we're going to have global food shortages. And this is really, really serious. That, that, the potential of a famine is very, very serious. 
Yeah, that's a good segue um, to to go to Andre now. Um, Andre, uh, uh, you are the chairman of the Ukrainian Venture Capital and Private Equity uh, Association, and we want to get into sort of uh, the global impact of the war. But before we do, I just want to ask you, what is the Ukrainian economy looking like now? Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes, I represent the 50 members of the UVCA, that actually investors organization been investing in Ukraine for the last 25 years. And uh, look, the war for us started in 2014, basically when the association was uh, formed in order f- to protect the interest of, of the investors. And uh, uh, one of the amazing facts is that for the last eight years, we've been able to build seven unicorns and 50 more in a pipeline with zero institutional money involved. So it's all private. And this is why the uh, Ukrainian IT industry, which is kind of twofold, we have an uh, outsourcing industry, which is export of the services, and also the product company I was referring to. So on this end, and we actually made it just the research I will share with everyone, I believe it's what it, did. it was done, that uh, even, uh, even in the current state of war, the, our business is working two shifts. Basically, all resilience you see now because of the private sector backup, which is actually literally is in the daytime protecting the country and the nighttime they're doing the shift on the business to deliver, as this is happening for 86 days in the row. And to, uh, in terms of our numbers, the, the uh, for last quarter, and we have these numbers, the IT export actually overperformed that even the previous one. It's more than $2 billion in export revenues. And that means... Even just, of course, we all uh, hope that our will become faster, but that will probably come up to uh, nine, ten billion dollars a year, and that's going to be probably the number one export industry because, as you know, the, the, the agro side it used to have seventeen billion, but because it's not about the even production we've been decreased, but because actually the logistics. Okay, we all know that our ports are closed in Black Sea for the reason. That's why we cannot feed the Europe, and that's why the food security is enormous threat for the Europe, not just because of the three-fourths of our uh, export or agri products going to the Europe, but also because of the Middle East countries in African countries are uh, totally dependent on Ukrainian and Russian export. Okay? And for them, uh, it's, it's going to be huge. So we continue to go, and uh, uh, in terms of investment, this is still happening. We have uh, nine exits in the first quarter. Yes, last year was a record year for the whole industry in terms of the number of the deals, in terms of the uh, uh, the, 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 the total amount of the VC industry is very integrated to US one. When you say Ukrainian startups, basically the our market is US one. Okay, so for Europe, it's also an opportunity now to get uh, some part of our business to do together. However, it all depends on us. So this is one point. So on one hand, the business uh, uh, in the practical uh, in the real sector has been destroyed. I can be honest with you, 50% of our businesses have stopped because of the destroy, uh, been destroyed or been relocated to the western part of Ukraine because it's, it's, it's a war, it's a real war going on. However, on the other hand, and this is our narrative we're going to discuss next week in the Davos, is that how to rebuild Ukraine, okay? Because this already happened as we speak, because, look, the all resilience coming from the private sector because the private sector transit $100 million, okay, just directly from the accounts. You don't think about the business when you're on the bombing, just exactly for the army, for the territory of defense, for the humanitarian, so on, so on. However, the business needs to perform in order to, uh, to to be able to do so. So the employment issue is very important because 8 million people have been re, uh, really uh, um, displaced in, inside of the country and 4, uh, 4 uh, million left, meaning the uh, uh, basically the, the women and, and the children because males are not allowed to leave the country because this is why the resilience is coming from as well. However, the employment is a very important part of our uh, uh, focus now. And look, let's be realistic. We know that uh, uh, the, the Marshall Plan now has become a mantra. And the politically, you see all the politicians in Kiev. And, but we all know that Marshall Plan will be developed in a few years. So, but what about to do uh, what is the other mantra is in all investment companies, ESG, Sustainable Development Goals. Impact investments. This is why Ukraine now, the six million people, they have access to the clear water. Our farmers are going to the fields to actually see it for the Europe, 
being under the mining, right? We have explosion every day when our farmers actually uh, farmers are exploded because we don't have it two three years to unmine these fields because we need to feed the, the local uh, the, the population but also the Europe. This happens as we speak. So how are you going to tackle this? Okay, not waiting for macroeconomics. Uh, not waiting. Yeah, the, the, the one-time aid is very important, donors, etc. But how about to make the project sustainable? And this is what we actually, when we come in, because all our business is now switching to actually to survival mode, okay? And then we are focused on essential needs of the people on the ground. And then when we come in and ask the foreign businesses to step in, meaning not to come to Kiev or to Ukraine to risk their lives, being not safe, nobody's safe in Ukraine, that is for sure. However, how about to supply what we now we're going to make a sustainable product, okay? whatever it is. What are filtering and plan, the hospitals, so on and so on. How about one-time aid to sustainable products? And then our offer is very simple. Go to your government and ask him, what about the downside protection? What about guarantees? What about insurance in case your equipment will be destroyed because the Russian missile will step in? We need yeah. to do this now. And the question is how? Why we invite all like like before? Look, uh, all our ecosystem very simple. We are yeah. fighting co-invest with us, and this happened as we speak, of course, on IT. But it's also we created the investment platform, the matching platform, when we actually yeah. invite all these businesses, international businesses, to get involved. And there are many things behind this, and one of those is also showcase it. How your uh -huh. company will showcase in real field in Ukraine about anything you can imagine, how it uh, saves people lives. It's basically the showcase. And then your politicians will back up, okay, your businesses, they will do together with us, joint venture, and this is going to make it sustainable, and this is how we're going to rebuild Ukraine. Because rebuild Ukraine, and I'm finishing, is a global effort to do something good in order to build something that we all want to benefit from, and I'm not mean only the euro, because obviously the, 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 all the system we have built have collapsed. We all let it happen. Let's put it this way, okay? We don't have an effective systems in place if you're dealing with the evil and nobody can make a deal now with the evil. But how to rebuild yeah. something in terms of decentralized governance? Because as you know, the Ukraine uh, and for four years adopted the digital assets law. How to use the technology to use on the decentralized type of things, including to rebuild Ukraine. You don't have to look at it from the up to the bottom approach because... I'm sorry, but in comparison with Afghanistan and Iraq, we have a strong the private sector, investors, and SMBs behind the country. So we need to get them included to make it right, and most importantly, to make it fast, because time is essential. We need to act now, not to wait when the politician will drop the uh, Marshall plane in a few years. We don't have time for that. For the sake of the world and the world, that's for sure. Understood, and thank you for a very detailed um, you know, sort of description of what's happening in Ukraine, and, and for the Specific action points. I think that's something for everyone sort of to take away. But I want to uh, welcome Eric Berglov um, to the panel, and, and maybe you come at an opportune time here because we are talking about the uh, the Ukraine and obviously the um, the disruption in supply chains and the rise of food prices and, co and commodity prices and energy prices and the inflation that has shot up as that sort of uh, comes in. So maybe I mean, as the chief economist of the uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, what do you see? You know, I mean, is, is inflation with us for a really long time? And if I could ask you a second question on that as well. You know, we talk a lot about inflation in the developed world, but this is probably going to hit the developing world even harder. Um, could you speak to that a bit more, Eric? Yes, and thank you. And thank you for, uh, sorry for being late. I had some problems connecting. But uh, the, uh, so, so definitely we are living in a perfect storm. It's uh, and it's going to be a long, perfect storm. I think you know the combination: food price increases, fuel prices, uh, you know, increased uh, emphasis on security, defense, and uh, uh, expenditure is going to go up. All these things are happening at the same time as inflation is going up in in the advanced uh, economies. Actually, they started going up before that in some of uh, some of the uh, emerging economies as well. And I think the, the obviously that is a problem in itself. But uh, what's really going to hit the emerging and developing world is the fact that now central banks will have to respond to this and, and raise interest rates. And that's going to lead to capital outflows from many emerging and developing countries. And, and that's going to come on top of, of these other, uh, uh, you know, very serious uh, impacts. So, so, yes, I think, you know, if you have asked me, 
two months ago, I would have said that you know, inflation is, 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 is temporary, it's going to go away. If you looked at each of the individual price rises, they, didn't, they, seemed, they cannot be sustained or, or it didn't look like they would be sustained. Uh, you know, if you looked at what happened in individual value chains, for example, it looked like that problem would go away because that's not a sort of a, 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 a long-term situation. But what happens is that it, these things happen in so many different value chains and, and, and that was in some way or another interlinked. So that has kind of made this temporary inflation permanent and you, we see it now how it spread into to wages and, 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 and you know far beyond these initial areas where, where, um, where we saw the, uh, the, the price increases. So, so I'm, I'm afraid we're going to be this with this for a while. You're going to see you know, very strong reactions from some central banks and they, the, the problem with that, with that is that you know central bank in, in, in the US or central bank in, in Europe is going to take uh, focus on you know what's good for that country's economy. They, they will take into account the rest of the world to the extent that influences your own economy, but they will not gonna, um, you know, take the perspective of the emerging and developing world when they make these decisions. And, and that's, that's what worries me at the moment. Yeah, and I mean, what, what I think is also interesting is that there is a bit of a contradiction in what's happening. I mean, we talk about the perfect storm, the chaos, and and we don't just mention how difficult it is to predict things. But Chris, you mentioned just, I mean, there are a lot of job openings right now, and it's difficult to hire people. Now, normally, that would not be the case in a, in a, in a, when the economy is in a downturn. How do you explain that? So, um, and this is the um, if lingering effect of, uh, uh, you know, the the money supply uh, that um, well, you know money was pumped in right to boost the economies in the last two years and uh, created a large number of um, uh, opportunities large number of jobs um, but i think we are now starting to see job losses um, you know it's um, uh, it's uh, you know it, it is a a lagging uh, indicator rather than a leading indicator. Um, but as Eric said, um, uh, wages are going up because um, um, you know people got used to working from anywhere and now they're refusing to come back to offices. So uh, you have to give them extra salaries. Um, similarly, certain skill sets are uh, in short supply. Um, I, I think there is a Ukraine effect here also. Ukraine uh, was a destination for high technology work, and uh, to some extent, um, you know that uh, created um, you know a, a, a situation in the rest of the world where demand for highly skilled people increased, and and that also has an impact on wages and things like that. So it's a it's a very interesting situation, but I think um, we will see. Uh, job losses going forward. That's my um, thinking right now. We will see job losses going forward. And with inflation going up, uh, it affects uh, growth. It affects um, um, every sector. And uh, that will also have um, that will also have uh, impact on job losses. Yeah. Deborah, if I could put you a little bit on the spot here around, you know, Eric sort of talked about what the central bank should do. And, and the U.S. central bank, I said that they might have been a bit too slow to react to this. Where do you see the U.S. sort of going forward in terms of sort of competitiveness? And, and what, what would if you were advising them, what would you tell them to do now? Raise interest rates quicker? Well, you know, thank you for that question. Um, you know, no, we, we just had a rate increase and another is projected. But, you know, for a long time. We've had virtually uh, money available at almost zero cost, which fueled a lot of this investment. And 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 we, you know, Chris was just talking about the high tech industry in the United States. There's a little bit of a bloodbath going on right now with a lot of the unicorns in high tech laying people off, having to retrench um, because they were able to access capital both from bank, really from the uh, venture capitalists, very very quickly. So um, I, I think. Probably not quite so fast, but on the other hand, we have the highest inflation we've had in 40 years. I mean, it's it's very shocking for people in the United States, particularly our middle class and 
and and people who are the lower economic um, place, you know, the, the the price of things that were, you know, say four dollars are now ten dollars. And I just saw on CNN, um, it's kind of funny, but it's not. You know, apparently all through the country at gas stations, you know, where it's now some places five six dollars a gallon, which for us is huge. There are these little stickers that have the president and vice president's faces saying, you did this, and they're taking them down and they get put up. But, you know, that means for a lot of people, they can't get to work. I mean, so the inflation's really serious. And the interest rate hike has now stopped the mortgage refinancing. And we have a housing crisis as well. One scarcity of available homes, prices soared up, and now the interest rate hikes. And so people's ability to get a home and a starter home has completely been curtailed. I do think going forward, um, and we've heard this from our, our distinguished colleagues here, there is going to be some, you know, shifting back to a momentum. But I do think the interest rates will increase for a while. But we know what happened back, you know, some 30 years ago when we had a high interest, high inflation, you know, no investment and unemployment. We don't have the unemployment. In fact, that's a concern that we don't have enough people. And, and as Chris said, people want to stay home and we have people who just come out of the workforce. But I hope we're going to talk about what are the bright sides too, because we have huge investments now in the United States through our rebuild uh, infrastructure bill. We're just waiting for our uh, United States Innovation Competitiveness Act to pass. I mean, we're talking about 30 plus billion dollars going into next generation semiconductors, hydrogen research centers, et cetera. So I, I'm positive that if we can, you know, have the macroeconomic conditions stabilized and we can have a high skilled, educated population and team with our partners around the world in these strategic areas. Because, look, the world is only going to get more digital. It's only going to get automation is only going to continue. And we're going to see decarbonization accelerating. And that's the reality going forward. And we need to capture and ride those waves. Yeah, I, I, you know, I want to ask you, it might be a sound like a very simple question, but I, I'm guessing there's a bit of a complicated answer. We talked about that there is really difficult to predict where things are going. And I mean, you listen to, to Deborah, it's like there is no clear answer to it, but there are optimism here. What's it like to run a business in that environment? Uh, <laughs> extremely exciting. And at the same time, many times makes you want to poop in your pants. <laughs> you know? I mean, at that level, because that's what you're facing. I mean, this is an extraordinary situation. But this is where leadership has come in. You know, leaders have pivot. Um, you know, uh, we, 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 we cannot remain stagnant. Entrepreneurs can't remain stagnant. I found tremendous opportunities through this process by just pivoting and understanding where the market is going. This period has given us an opportunity to really accelerate some of our, if you like, sustainable technology businesses. Uh, and, you know, our modular, modular building company has grown. We've built three times the number of factories in Australia. We are we're just uh, about to launch a factory in America, investing in the U.S. Uh, we, we launched a factory in, in U.K. And we're about now to enter India in a significant way, which we have never done before, um, and a very significant way. We've acquired in India. Um, so if you we take, if you play chess instead of checkers, the opportunities are plenty. It's there. But you have to play chess. There are no short-term gains here, right? This is, this, is, this is not a short-term. This is where you've planned, you're looking ahead, and you're saying, where, where will we be in three years, five years, eight years? And then you position yourself for that. Ukraine is a tremendous opportunity. I know that, right? They will get out of the situation they're in now. Russia will come to its senses eventually, or rather Putin will. Uh, and, and we will then have to figure out how much rebuild is required and therefore what the opportunities are there as, as we move ahead. Um, you know, and, and as far as the, the question of you know, countries like India, even Malaysia, uh, not quite disengaging from Russia or China, uh, as the West has, for example. Um, you must understand, we have our own reasons. We have our own national security issues. We have our own trade issues that we have to deal with. Uh, that that are separate from what Europe has to deal with, uh, but at the same time, you can see that positioning is already there. You know, yeah. we we see where we have to go, and we are moving in that direction and positioning ourselves. And businesses are doing the same. 
So a businessman like money, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, just jumping in and saying, okay, you know what, this, the situation is what it is, but in everything, in every decade where this economic disasters appeared, and I'll call it economic disaster of one kind or another, but we've had one, let's be honest, we've always had one, every decade, something, okay, <laughs> that is global and that just hits the ball. Now we have this. This one is exasperated by both uh, a health crisis that we've not faced for a couple hundred years, uh, a, a financial uh, crisis, uh, and you know a political so, uh, uh, crisis in Europe, uh, and it's all come together and all impact us. Um, again, opportunities are there if you play chess. If you can just look ahead and realize markets will come back, there will be stability. So economic leaders, CEOs, chairmen of the companies have to take that position. That will stabilize the market. That will bring investment back to areas that's needed. And then others will follow. So this is the time where uh, senior economic leaders have to put on their big boy pants on and jump in and play the role that's required of them. That is to lead. That is to go in. That is to take the chance and take the positions that is required of them so that others can follow That's a great rally call. I'm, I'm sorry to bring it down a little bit, but I do think it's important to address this, Eric, if I could come to you again. I mean, we talk a lot about the COVID recovery and what that means, um, the Ukraine uh, war and, and the economic situation that's caused. But we're on another deadline here for 2050 to reach net zero. I mean, how likely is it with all of these things happening that the climate crisis and the, and the resources that are needed for that are going to go onto the back burner? Yeah, I think we, we have to be realistic that in the, the very short term, I think there will be a, a kind of retrenchment or, or a, I mean, clearly what Ukraine war, or I shouldn't show call it, the war in Ukraine uh, is, is showing is that uh, Europe must become independent of, of, of uh, or, or must um, reduce its reliance on, on, uh, on, on, on Russian energy and, and whether it's oil or whether it's gas that's obvious but unfortunately in the in the meantime as uh, you know Europe and, and much of the western world is, is investing in, in renewables and so on that will be uh, going back to you see what's happening in the US now with you know massive increase in in, 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 in gas production gas deliveries exports uh, oil and so on. That is happening also in, in Europe. So that will be the short-term impact. What I hope is that it will provide an additional incentive for for countries to, to really think through how they can uh, develop their energy security in a more sustainable way. I'm actually right now in, in Prague, in, in the Czech Republic, and, and uh, there is a, a, a group here that thinking very seriously, how can Central Europe, which is probably the, the most dependent uh, of, of uh, Uh, of, of Europe on 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 uh, on uh, these the supplies. How can they uh, develop uh, their their independence? So, yes, this is it's, it's a it's a short term step backwards, I think. But in the medium term and long term, I think it sent the right the right signals. The question is, of course, will the money be there? Because we know that uh, if you really want to have rapid decarbonization, you need going to need active equity markets. You're going to need you know a lot of investment from risk-willing uh, investors and, and will that be there uh, in the short medium term it's, it's not so obvious but uh, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that there we have in this group at least uh, some people who are willing to to take the the risks involved and, and I should say also for, you know we, from my sort of Asian perspective uh, you know there is a lot of positive things happening in Asia around you know RESEP is you know the largest uh, free trade area that has been formed uh, and it's opening up, bringing together a lot of bilateral arrangements and, and creating opportunities for both uh, for, for trade, but also maybe more long term, there will also be the, uh, you know, the CPTPP, which is, uh, you know, going much deeper and maybe allowing much stronger collaboration and, and could deal with some of the data issues, some of the intellectual property, some of the uh, subsidies issues and so on. So there's a, a whole... Um, Sort of new world opening up in Asia that I think we should 
take some solace from it that this is there will be opportunities created there and also uh, in terms of uh, the uh, decarbonization that countries will you know the asia is very uh, carbon intensive right now and, and a lot of there's a huge need of new investments if we can uh, foster these uh, merging trade and investment relationship that could be you know very very important for for the world as a whole yeah Thank you, Andre. I want to come to you for a final word in a minute. But before Chris, just briefly, where are you seeing the green shoots? Um, I'm seeing green shoots everywhere because every industry is changing. Um, you know, automotive is changing, healthcare is changing, energy is changing, um, retail and e-commerce is changing. Every industry is changing, and there are huge opportunities. Now, where I, where I'm unhappy or where I have a discomfort is. It's still the old model. People who have money, people who have assets are going to benefit. Middle class, lower middle class, developing countries are going to suffer. I think we have to figure out a better model. I think that's very, very important. Thank you, Chris. Now, Andre, if you could bring us home here today, um, you've heard a lot of positive, um, you know, sort of um, opportunities here from the panel around Ukraine. Um, I mean, is is what what would be what do you see as the most sort of positive thing that could happen in the medium term to support Ukraine? Well, we all discuss here how the Russian and Ukrainian economy, economy which is only three point four percent of the global one, but now the all economy in the world affected because of this. And now the question is how actually to stop the suffering from all the all, uh, from around the world. And the solution is actually how to make the Ukraine strong, not only, uh, I mean, from the all aspects, not only for the Europe now, and this is the only way to do this. So the Rebuild Ukraine project is not only to rebuild infrastructure, actually something else, and I'm, I'm sure it's going to be more exciting to go to the Mars. Probably the Ukraine is going to be more, much challenging, but the impact of this as economic cluster together with Europe and with all international uh, uh, partners are very important for the global sake, because you see the impact of this. And the question is what to do something now by using the many innovations now, which has actually showed the world who's who, et cetera, et cetera. And the innovation actually at times in the, in, in the times of crisis, but it's not the crisis because it's not just another war and everybody realized. And obviously for the Russia, as you know, the principal decision has been made. they out. But who is in? And that is Ukraine, because Ukraine always built the grain and the brain basket. However, as you know, the Europe is trying to get dependency uh, from China because they know what is in Ukrainian land, what's a deposit there. And it's very important because the, 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 the gas, in, which is still undeveloped in the Ukraine, it was, was political for 20 years, can be used for the production, not only Ukraine, but also for the, for the half of the Europe as well. That was just politically was not undeveloped. So it's there. Rare materials are there, so I'm, I'm sure the only way to do this is to make the Ukraine strong, uh, and, and everything is there in terms of the business, and the, and it, it just kind of become uh, for everyone clear that's the only way to do this. That's the only way, to, and everybody is welcome from the many sides, and this is how we can do uh, something good for all of us. This, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've heard the word perfect storm a few times in this panel, and we certainly do have that with Ukraine, COVID Ukraine and the problems with inflation and supply chains. But, you know, I, am, uh, I applaud this panel for the uh, optimism that you've shown and for seeing the opportunity in the chaos. And uh, as you talk about how that provides the um, sort of opportunity to pivot to different businesses and make them more sustainable. So I want to thank you all for uh, for joining for the very lively discussion and the incredible insight that we've had in so many into so many areas and parts of the world today, and most of all for getting out on time. That will get me a, a kudos from Frank. <laughs> so thank you all very much thanks indeed, and thanks to all of you who joined us live. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.